Welcome back everybody. In today's video, we are going to be moving everything from this motor onto this motor. So if you didn't catch the last video, we pulled this out of a four door Gen 1 Montero. This is the three liter V6. And the customer that I'm working with wanted to buy a new motor. So he's got a new motor. Something went wrong with this one, stopped running, making a horrible noise. And so we pulled this one out and now we're going to move all the parts from here to here. And you can see there are quite a few parts. I was able to pull this mostly complete, which I prefer because it's way easier to work on the stand and flip it around than it is to work in the car. And so today we're going to be doing two things. One, we're going to be disassembling this. And then two, we're going to be examining what other parts are needed. The guy I'm working with sent me a bunch of parts. We're gonna lay those all out on a table and we're gonna lay out all this stuff on a table and we're gonna see what did he have and what does he need? And so I'll tell you right now, there's a few things that are coming out. Both of his exhaust manifolds are cracked. I wanna examine things like the timing belt cover and I know he's got motor mounts and plugs and wires, but I wanna make sure before I start doing this that I can give him a list of things and say, hey, you need to order all of this before this can move over to here. So let's get into it. Now, before tearing into a motor like this, even if you've got something like the factory service manual, which I do have, it's always good to take video and pictures of where everything is. Uh, so, so right now I'm gonna be looking at this right here, the distributor, making sure I have a good understanding of where these lines go, how they line up. It's good to get an idea of the vacuum lines, the electrical connectors, even like this, we're gonna be pulling off this wiring harness, which needs to be redone, it needs to be rewrapped. But I wanna make sure I get the routing and the plumbing of this correct, that way when I drop it back in, it fits all nice and snug, especially back here with the heater core hoses. Um, and you you got those coming off. You want to make sure that you get that all right. So I'm going to start by pulling off the stuff that I know I have. And that's going to involve the distributor and the spark plugs. I'm going to pull the alternator off. And then I think I'm going to start working here on the accessory drive. All these pulleys seem to be okay. Obviously, if you got the money, it's nice to replace these. However, it's not that hard to do in the car. So this is one that I tend to say, eh, if they're spinning good now, they might last another 50,000 miles. I'm not sure, but probably probably don't need to replace them. You can check them for play. Oh, this one's got, oh, this is loose right there. That's a good thing to note because uh, this is the tensioner one. But either way, I'm gonna probably leave those on. I'm gonna pull all that stuff off and see if we can get this to look a little more like this. Okay, now the first thing I was doing on this motor was turning it over to top dead center. That's mostly out of habit. We're not gonna save this block or this head, but I want to set this to top dead center before I started working on it. And while I was doing that, I heard a sound coming from here. Now, the owner just said it started making a loud noise and it wouldn't run. So I actually don't know why this motor went bad. I assumed a spun bottom end bearing, but I pulled this cover off and check this out. This cam bolt sheared in half. Now what causes this? I guess just wear over time. There's quite a few miles on this motor. It could be improper maintenance, but my guess is this just happened. So uh, later, later on when we have this pulled apart, I'll be able to show you guys what happened in there. But my guess is that this, the other half of this bolt is snapped off in there. So this is a really good thing that we're replacing this motor because getting that camshaft out, while it is possible, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If you're this far in, you might as well replace it. So chances are good that we had pistons hit valves on this side and either the pistons or the valve train or both are compromised. But it's always reassuring when you're doing a job this big to know why you're doing it. You know, it's not just some random noise. It's not just a tensioner or a pulley making that sound. This, is a, this isn't catastrophic failure per se, but this definitely warrants getting a new motor. It's gonna be the more economical way to do it, peace of mind, and this is a pretty gnarly break. So with that discovery, let's go ahead and tear into this motor and figure out what we need to order and what else can go on here. we are getting into this thing. Uh, as you can see, tons of oil leaks in here. So that's one of the things that I suspected with this, with being a, a rod bearing, is I thought because of how much oil leak leakage there is, it's probably just low on oil. Like I said, found out 
it was this cam right here. And uh, it snapped off the little indexing ring. So the nice thing about getting a whole new motor is it's already got the cams, already got the heads, all that stuff. So I actually am really curious to split this motor open, which I'll probably do just for fun to see because when this snapped, not only did this side, this bank probably collide, but because the timing was all off, I bet you it hit all the way around. So I am able to turn this motor over by hand, which means probably pretty low compression. The spark plugs are, are still in, but here's where I'm at. I took off the coil um, wires and I started pulling down this front accessory. There's a lot of different bolts on here of how it goes together. I'm thankful to have the factory service manual to help me put this back together. But at this point, I pulled off the oil um, pickup and, or not the oil pickup, sorry, the oil uh, filter housing and the lines for the cooler. And I'm gonna start moving my way around and tearing this thing down. And again, I'm looking for parts that are broken. I'm also trying to catalog kind of where things are. I'm keeping good track of my bolts. Um, I'm gonna try to work my way from the front back and then from the top down. Um, my goal is to pull the oil pan last, but we'll see how far I get. I need to move the oil pan, the valve covers, all the intake, all the accessory drives over to there. That's a pretty bare block. It's got the block, the heads, the oil pump, the cams and the valve train but everything else needs to move over there. So with that, I'm gonna keep working my way back, take off some of these timing components, try to get these cam gears off. Well, that one's already off, but take this one off, set that aside, and then start working from the top down. Okay, so we are just about torn down on this motor to the point where we're ready to move things onto there. I've started to categorize everything and it's obviously gonna need to be cleaned, a little organized and rebuilt. So we got the valve covers, they're gonna get cleaned up, new gaskets, distributor is gonna be new, new gaskets here. One of the things you can tell about this motor, look at how much water, or antifreeze in this case, because it's green, has been leaking on this thing. I mean, it doesn't seem like any of this stuff is properly sealed. And so I'm gonna be examining all the hoses or replacing them, making sure I have all the gaskets and making sure that this doesn't do this in the future, as well as injectors and uh, for the fuel. And then this whole thing needs to get cleaned up. He does have two cracked exhaust valves and along with the leaking coolant here, uh, the radiator's leaking. So if we go over here, you can see more signs of that. And uh, there's two things I need to pull off of here. One, I need to pull what's left of the motor mounts um, off of there to move over. We got new motor mounts, but the hardware is gonna need to transfer, as well as the oil pan and this kind of like oil pan bell housing bracing. All of that needs to come over. But personally, I'm pretty curious to see what the inside of this looks like. Given that the timing belt basically snapped because that cam sheared off, I wonder what the valve train looks like and what the pistons look like. So I'll probably go a little further and tear this all the way down just because of curiosity. Okay, I've made an interesting discovery, or rather I've remembered something that I knew in the past, which is that these three liter motors, these V6s and the Gen 1, are non-interference. If you're unfamiliar with what that means, that means that at no point can the pistons actually hit the valves. So I've been blabbering on about how this is probably catastrophic failure because pistons hit valves and that causes all sorts of issues. However, if you look in these cylinders, there's actually no indication that the pistons hit the valves. Furthermore, if you look at the heads, all of these are properly seated. If you shine a light in between um, the where the back of the valve and this side, I don't see any light. So theoretically, these could be fine. Now, the pre or the owner of this vehicle decided that he was going to replace the motor, and after seeing the state of it, how much oil it leaks and the coolant, I don't really blame him. It's easier to start with a fresh block, seal it up, rather than go in, clean everything, reseal it. And I think this motor has 300,000 miles on it. So I can't blame him for that. However, it is, I guess, theoretically possible 
that if you pulled the crank or the camshaft out, retimed everything and put it back together, that this would run. So that's an interesting discovery. Um, I kind of forgot that these are non-interference motors. I'm so used to the other motors where the pistons hit the valves and everything gets messed up and you have to check the bottom end clearances and that kind of thing. But here we are. So got all the parts out here. They are all labeled. Got the parts that I need to replace figured out. Got their parts that I need to get new ones for figured out. I'm going to get all of this cleaned up and then we're going to start assembling this. And I'm excited to see this motor actually looks smaller than this motor for the first time in the process. Before this was the bare block uh, with just the heads on it. And now this is all the way down to just the block. So now we're going to get on to putting the new parts or the, or the redone parts onto the new motor. So I'm plugging away here and I just got the cams put on and I got them torqued down. I had to replace this cam bolt because remember the other one snapped off in there. And so I got them torqued down to the correct spec, which is right around 42 foot, foot pounds. Got the water pump on, got the timing belt tensioner on, and now I'm going to go through the process of figuring out how to set the timing belt for this, as well as get some other things cleaned up. Got my intake manifold gaskets on. This thing is really crusty, so I need to figure out how to clean this up best I can, maybe just scrape it with a toothbrush, get some of that off um, so that when we put it back together, one, it looks nice, and two, you can figure out where it's leaking. So uh, I'm gonna jump into this timing procedure. Thankfully, I got this kit from Lusso Overland. These are all parts supplied by the guy I'm doing this for, but he went to Lusso Overland and got the parts, and so it comes with all of the factory service manual instructions. I also have the factory service manual pulled up on my computer so that I can get all the torque specs right. So let's jump into this and see if I can't get a belt on this thing. So this has been one step forward, two steps back, because as you might've noticed, if you've rebuilt one of these before, I did not assemble these in the correct order. So uh, on this one, I've had this one on and off and on and off. I was missing a seal, then I was missing the distributor plate, and then I was missing the timing plate. I think I've got it dialed at this point. So there's the timing mark right there um, so we can get everything lined up. And then on this one, it's the alternator bracket. So I left the alternator attached to the alternator bracket. I've got that tucked behind here. These cams are loose right now. So I'm going to torque those down, hopefully, fingers crossed, for the last time. Then I can set the timing. Then I can get this all dialed in. One thing I'm waiting on is this is the old crank bolt. And I've got a shortened crank bolt coming from Lusso Overland. That's the updated crank bolt. These tend to have just enough mass and enough length on them that they actually walk out over time. These will get loose um, and they'll back off. So rather than throw a red Loctite on it and potentially damage the crank, uh, they have opted for a shorter bolt. So that's what they do. Another thing I got from Lusso Overland in the process is these exhaust manifolds. Now, these are sweet because um, Lusso Overland stocks them. They, they, I think he has one for every single model of uh, Montero. And so that's nice because these are almost always cracked at this age. So these two were both cracked. So we got new ones in as well as this motor doesn't have an EGR. It didn't come with one. It's not, it hasn't been deleted, just never had one. And so the exhaust manifolds have the EGR plate, but um, they, or they have the opening, but we plated it off. So that's a kit that comes from Lusso Overland. Looks like a trick piece of aluminum there. Pretty sweet. And then we got this one over here. One thing I wanted to point out um, on the previous engine, so the one I took apart, it had this sweet feature on the exhaust manifold. Not only do these come off, these bend like they used to, to protect it from heat, so it's a heat shield, but it had one, three, and five labeled on these cylinders. Now, unfortunately, I love that, but the gasket kit that came with it 
uh, only had one, three, and five. And so on this side, I just had to flip it over. So now it says five, three, and one when this is really two, four, and six. So the other one had two, four, and six on this side, which is pretty cool. This aftermarket gasket kit does not, but I've got these all tightened down. I've got the screws in this new, these new manifolds did require me to put these studs in. So you put two nuts in, use a jam nut and tighten it down. And so that's all good to go. Now I think I'm finally going to get back into timing this motor. All right, timing belt is on. Now, this one is different than a lot of the other Mitsubishi Monteros I've done. And if you're looking for a more in-depth video of how to do a timing belt, I have one that I did on my Gen 3, which goes over a lot of details. But let me just highlight a few things here. One, lined up the marks in the crank and the cams. So you can see there's a little divot right there lined up with that mark. This one is lined up with that mark this one right here lined up with that mark then you start on the bottom just like you do on other monteros and travel counterclockwise that way you're applying the most tension here everything should line up around the water pump get to here this is the loaded cam on this three liter motor then you come down here and you should have a bunch of slack here you release this bolt and this spring pulls in the tension now this is an interesting thing so the spring pulls in the tension then what you're supposed to do is put the bolt on here, actually put the flange and the bolt on here and rotate this by hand at least two times while this is loose. Then once you've rotated it two or three times and you've let this pull up all the slack, then you tighten down this bolt. Now that's pretty interesting because that means that this tensioner is actually, this is just here for the beginning. And then theoretically, this is going to hold tension for the rest of the time. And if it fails, it'll pull it tight. But this is a pretty interesting system, pretty old school. So what I'm going to do now is I've got that all buttoned up. I'm going to go ahead and rotate it over by hand two or three times and then make sure it's all lined up, still looking good. And then I'm going to go ahead and tighten this down. Another thing worth mentioning, because this is a non-interference motor, you can set the cams and the crank at any time. So you don't have to worry about valves and pistons hitting each other. Um, you can just move this around. But you saw that I used a special tool to grab the outside of the teeth. I never like to grab the inside when I'm moving the cams when they're loaded, because when they snap, then this cast metal hits something hard and it could break. I also don't love putting a wrench on here because that jerky motion could, unknown to me, loosen this bolt and cause some issues. So I'm going to run through that procedure, get this all buttoned up, and then put the timing cover on, which I'm real excited about. we have ran into our first really big problem, which is pretty good considering the motor is mostly put together. However, I did foresee this being a problem and that's the dipstick location. So here's what I mean. On this block, which is the original motor, if you look down here, there's the dipstick hole. It's on the passenger side, goes all the way through the block. It's probably about an inch deep. And uh, that obviously you put that in so that you can measure um, how much oil you have. So that's important. Now on this motor you get that in there lines up right here i could tell it was going to come out here and that motor mount which goes right like this is notched to let it go out however this motor came with this blocked off now this isn't that uncommon because this motor could have been in several different cars now the motor uh dipstick oil check right right here might have been used in a different car, right? So it would come out and go over here. And so I actually mocked it up over here. I was going to see if it was going to work. However, this motor mount fits squarely on top of it, totally blocking it. So I kind of have two choices here. 
The first one is to try to modify this bracket to somehow fit that. And that's not a great option because I really do want to use the factory specs. And even though I assume it's going to be the same, there's no telling how the dipstick geometry, the actual like length of the dipstick might change and if it would read high or low. And I don't want to deal with that. So the safer option is to put a block out plug in there and to come over here and drill through that. Now, drilling through the block is nerve wracking. Um, obviously, if something goes wrong here, it's a pretty big deal. At a very minimum, I'm gonna have to take off the uh, manifold and the oil pan and figure out my best angle of attack. It might be possible, and I don't love this, but it might be possible to drill from the pan side up because getting a drill in here is gonna be pretty difficult. This is a common problem on different Toyotas, at least that I've run into, and I'm sure it's common with other motors. And they actually make a jig where you kind of position it and then you can drill through. I don't think something like this exists for the Mitsubishis. So I'm going to do a little bit of research and see where I'm at. But at this point, I've got to figure out how to check the oil on it. So whether it's making something to go over there or working with this side and drilling a hole here, we're going to find out. So I'm going to pause here, figure that out, and we'll rejoin the conversation when I learn something. All right, that was a little bit of a mess. So I did a lot of stuff off camera. It's been a week or so now since I filmed that last clip. And it's because I had to figure out what to do with this dipstick. And at this point, I've got it dialed. So I've got the motor all together, but let me tell you what I did to relocate this dipstick. And I'll start with my first solution, which is on this side. So my initial thoughts were that I was gonna be able to move this motor mount around and I was going to be able to relocate the dipstick in the hole that was there. As you can see right there, that's the hole that came on the block. This was most likely used in a front wheel drive vehicle or some other car or something else where the dipstick was on that side. However, the big issue that I was running into was even though I could fit the dipstick into that hole, there's actually no room on this side because of this oil pan bump right here. So the reason this is here is because the front diff goes here and I remember, and you can actually see from these marks on here, it's really tight. So after looking into it, the dipstick was gonna wanna come down right here. It wasn't gonna be able to even go far enough to measure it. So I mocked it up, I worked on it and it just wasn't gonna work. So I had to seal that hole up. And the way I did that is it's a tapered hole. And so I found a piece of scrap metal that was round that would fit in there and I wedged it in there, got it nice and wedged, and then I covered it in, uh, what is that? Is that JB Weld or I think I used RTV. Used some RTV. So it's wedged in there. Like I said, it's a tapered hole. So I wedged it in there in such a way that it can't go down and it can't come back up. It's good as plugged. So that's good on that side, which brought me over to here. And I filmed a little bit of this, but this was kind of one of those things where it's like, I'm, I'm just figuring it out. I'm trying to make it work. So I apologize. I didn't get the whole story on video, but I'll throw some clips in here as I go. So what I did here is it started off with a little pad right there where the oil stick goes. And I went ahead and I drilled that out and I stepped it all the way up to a half inch bit. That's roughly the size of the other hole and I was able to get it mostly angled down correctly with a little bit of adjustment. I also bent the dipstick uh, in, in such a way that I think it's gonna clear everything, but this actually makes a pretty big difference. And then there was a little receiver on the oil pan for the dipstick to go back into. And so that happens right here on this side of the pan. As you can see, there's no bump on this side. It goes way down. So the dipstick actually sits probably right about there when it's fully installed. And now at this point, Pulled the dipstick all the way out. It's gonna be hard to do with one hand, but goes right back in and that's gonna be able to measure the oil level correctly. This is not a huge problem um, that I'm aware of, but if, if you don't have the guts to drill a huge hole, I mean, they're probably talking an inch thick in your engine block, this one's tough. I called a couple machine shops here in town. They wouldn't touch it, so I was on my own. I could have made a jig to do this, but I just did it freehand. I got it as aggressive as I could to go straight down because that's where the pan was. And I think it's gonna work. So it, it's gonna measure oil. It's a little custom, but it, for the installed user, once it's in there, you probably won't know. So after I did that, reinstalled the oil pan, made sure it was super clean. I've been cleaning everything else up, got the exhaust manifold reinstalled, and I got these lower bell housing supports on with the motor mounts. I also replaced some of the bolts that were missing when I first did this. 
So at this point, the motor is sort of ready. It's gonna come off the stand, and that's where I'm gonna end this video. And then in the next video, I'll install the clutch and some of the shielding on the back. Then we'll get it lined up, dropped in, and fired up, and I can have this project out of my garage, and it can be back on the road. So, hope you guys enjoyed this whole breakdown of swapping the motor over. I know it's been a long video. Next week, we're gonna get this thing in the car, so stay tuned, and I'll see you on the next one.